Uh, hi, everybody. My uh, PhD at uh, Delft University of Technology. Uh, and my focus is on developing reputation metrics for internet intermediaries. As we go through the presentation, I will uh, explain what are recognized as internet intermediaries and what are reputation uh, metrics, etc. So the project that I'm working on is a collaboration with SIDN, the N Data NL Registry, and uh, NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Center. So. Um, I will start by the question that we were posed uh, some months ago by the Dutch police that uh, they uh, would like to know that who are the worst hosting providers uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the question was originally created by Dutch police or asked by Dutch police because uh, at a, a report that are published by uh, their, uh, their researchers, the Netherlands was the worst performer um, country uh, within Europe and Middle East in terms of uh, hosting uh, malicious servers. So uh, we were wondering who can actually answer this question precisely. Can hosting providers answer this question? Do they know uh, about uh, the security that they are providing in their services? Do they know about the level of abuse that are being done on their domain names or their uh, web servers? And uh, do they know how bad they are performing in comparison to their competitors in the same market? What about the users? Do they know uh, the services that they are buying from housing providers are safe? Even if they claim it is safe, uh, what is the knowledge of the users? What is the uh, factor that will determine for the users to buy a service or not? Is it security if they, they are willing to pay for it? These questions uh, can be partially answered by a concept that is introduced uh, maybe 20 years ago uh, by an economist uh, called uh, market. For, uh, it's a famous example called market for lemons. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it. Uh, it describes a market in which um, sellers are trying to sell used cars. There is two type types of cars. Uh, one type that is bad type or lemon that costs for thousand euros and the other that is a good car and cost two thousand euros and the buyers cannot distinguish the two from each other so uh, what do you think would be the willingness of the people that cannot distinguish a good car from a bad car to pay to buy a car sorry So we have two types of prices, 1,000 for a lemon or a bad car, and 2,000 for a good car. But this knowledge, only the sellers have. The buyers doesn't know which is good, which is bad. Reputation. Sorry? Yeah, so imagine that they, so this is their first time, and they do not know any information about the sellers. So the, the guess, or well, this is explained also in the article, that the market price or the equilibrium market price will yield towards 1,000 euros because price would then would be the proxy for the users. And of course, everyone uh, is willing to pay less if they don't know the quality. They cannot compare the quality. So then the, the sellers of the good quality cars are not willing to sell their cars anymore because it's underpriced, right? So this is what is partially happening in the security market. Users doesn't know or cannot know this, a secure software or, or a secure service. What they know is what the service provider claims and in fact also the reputation of the service provider if there is a reputation in the market. So what is happening is that this concept is called information asymmetry. So there is an information asymmetry between the sellers and buyers and also between the service provider themselves. So you cannot compare yourself to your competitor or, it's, or if you can, it's relatively hard. So then what happens is that uh, security is not an indicator uh, for users to buy a service anymore, but 
other indicators can determine a service for the users to buy. It can be the network effect. So if a service is generally popular, then I will go for it because others are also recommending it. Or if a service is cheap, maybe I will go for it, but not because it's secure, because how can I know as an end user? So then if the sellers or the providers of the services know that the users cannot distinguish how secure their service is, and even if they can, they are not willing to pay for it because it's not something, something tangible, then they, their incentives to improve the level of security of the services that they are providing is not so high. It's like the firmest uh, market strategy that uh, uh, deliver it today and fix it tomorrow. And tomorrow uh, is an indication of when and what kind of uh, uh, malicious activities will happen in the meantime. So this is the basis of the presentation that I'm going to give today. Our goal in this whole research group is to design uh, ways to improve the uh, security incentives of internet intermediaries. One of the ways uh, that uh, we, are, uh, we come up to do that, or one of the ways that is uh, possible to do that, is uh, through designing reputation metrics. Uh, through publicly uh, publishing these metrics and uh, trying to motivate uh, market players to compete against each other for going on top of these kind of lists, etc. The project is called Remedies, uh, founded uh, by SIDN. Um, so what we do is that we start from incident data it can be um, phishing, malware attack, botnet CNC, uh, spam, um, malicious servers, um, etc. And then um, we map this incident, incident data to um, any actor in DNS ecosystem. These actors um, are registries, registrars, uh, TLDs uh, or TLD providers, authoritative name servers, and the resellers of hosting providers, uh, etc. And then we come up with the reputation metrics. So these metrics can be in are designed in three levels. The first layer is the TLD la layer, uh, TLD like .nl.com or any other uh, examples. Um, and we, we design a metric to count the maliciousness of a specific TLD provider um, for um, different things. Um, it depends on the feed that we are using. It can be that the number of botnet CNC servers is an indicator or it depends on the feed. On the second layer, we focus on the players uh, within a TLD. So these players are as I named also, uh, can be hosting providers, can be registrars, their resellers. Uh, and the, the third layer is the network lever in which we focus on the resources on the network, like uh, open DNS resolvers, uh, any vulnerability in uh, DNS software, uh, etc. So uh, from now on in the presentation, I will show you examples of the case studies that we did up to now. The first one will be security metrics for TLD providers and the second one will be security metric for hosting providers. Uh, I will walk you through the steps in which we, we use to design these metrics and later publish them to the market players. So um, maybe it sounds naive as I'm, I explain the general picture, but when you want to go to the detail of the design, especially because we are doing this project together with the market players, it's become, uh, becoming important not to wrongly uh, estimate the amount uh, that each operator or each player can uh, provide securities. That is why these metrics should be very carefully designed. One of the steps to take into account all the possible um, end users of an actor, in this case TLD service provider like that, .nl, is to normalize whatever we come up of a maliciousness of a network by the size of that player. 
So for instance, um, imagine .NL um, TLD provider, how you can estimate the size of .NL domains. Either you have to have access to uh, dot, um, .NL zone file, uh, or you have to have a way to have access to passive DNS data, which is not yet uh, completely 100% presenting the number of domains in a TLD. Uh, or you get it from um, different independent sources like anti-phishing working group that publishes uh, the amount of domain per DLD, etc. So that's what we did. Uh, first, we uh, for each TLD, uh, TLD I mean both CCTLDs, so... Uh, and top-level domains like .com, .net, .org. We use their zone files if the zone file was open access. Uh, and also to cross-check that, we use the uh, records published by Antifishing Working Group last year and also uh, our um, passive uh, DNSDB data from Farsight Security. So um, what we counted uh, in the, uh, to estimate the size was three, uh, three different estimates. We counted number of unique domains, number of fully qualified domains, and number of URLs. This count, uh, you will see later in the presentation that how this count can affect a place of each network player in terms of maliciousness or abuse level. Um, there is another way, so one way to count how malicious an operator is, is to, uh, uh, is to look at the abuse data, like the examples I already gave, and uh, see uh, what are the entities in the abuse data, what are the URLs used that is related to a certain uh, TLD operator. The other way is to see how these TLD operators are reacting toward abuse, or the abuse handling method. Uh, how can we have an estimate of abuse handling is that we, uh, we can measure the amount of time that it takes per provider to take down a reported domain name, which can be in a blacklist, reported can be in a blacklist, or directly emailed to abuse handling of that provider or any other public uh, shame list. Uh, so we called it an uptime metric. For, in order to do that, we, uh, we have a DNS-based scanner and also content-based scanner to scan for the amount of time that each domain is still up and working. So uh, the data sets that we used uh, are um, from different sources. We used uh, data sources from command and control servers by Z provided by Zeus Tracker. Uh, phishing uh, URLs from Fish Tank, an anti-phishing working group, and different kind of malicious uh, URLs from Stop Badware, which is a firm, uh, American firm working with uh, a pa uh, partner of Google uh, Safe Browser. So this is how we counted number of abuse per provider in each uh, abuse feed. So. And this is a kind of uh, visual presentation that you can see the deviation of each uh, provider according to their relative sizes. So in this graph, on the x-axis, you see the number of domains per provider. And on the y-axis, you see the number of phishing domains. So uh, the x-axis is showing you the size of that provider. And the Y uh, is the number of phishing domains that are used for abuse, phishing abuse. Each blue dot is a CCTLD, and each red dot, uh, red star is a, a gen GTLD. So I didn't put the name of the TLDs because I didn't want to publicly share this information. But uh, as it might be obvious, the outliers in the graph, the ones on the top, are uh, very popular GTLDs that are um, used more than the, the new TLDs that are somewhere down in the graph here. And uh, in general, uh, you see that the amount of abuse on CCTLDs are more than uh, GTLDs. One of the reasons is that um, uh, CCTLDs are mostly under control of one 
big entity, whereas a, a GTLD can be operated by several different uh, entities, and then security uh, measures that they have can be different from each other. So if I change this graph, so you see, so how I count badness for each provider here is to count second level domains. If I uh, change it to counting URLs, you see that there is a big change uh, in how uh, each dot is po positioned itself. And, um, and that is the main reason why we uh, actually did the both counts is that uh, in certain TLDs, especially um, CC TLDs, you see that um, a second level domain has, I don't know, hundreds or thousands third level domains on it that is abused. So if we count the number of second level domains that are abused, it might be two. But if we count the number of fully qualified domains or URLs that is used for phishing attacks, it might be 2,000. So then, uh, um, with counting URLs, we might get a better indication of how that operator um, is performing in terms of security. The same goes for fully qualified domains. So, uh, so some one of the dots in the top um, is under. Um, so you see, um, for instance, here you see the, the influence of price and the amount of maliciousness. Some of the ones that are operating really bad are the providers that are offering free hosting services. So then you would expect that those services are used more, more by criminal because it's less costly to use it. Next. Um, we also did a short study on reputation metric for hosting providers. Uh, this is again the process for creating the metric. I will walk you through it uh, very quickly. So you have the abuse feed. Um, oh, and uh, well, let me explain this first. Uh, we had the dilemma to what to call a hosting providers from a network perspective. So uh, one would think that hosting providers are the servers on the network, or the ASS, or uh, the IP owners. But in fact, it can be a mixture of all these. An AS can be also a hosting provider, but also an ISP. An IP owner may be a reseller of a HSP or, uh, hosting provider, maybe not. He just owned the IP and he's using um, boxes of other uh, services to route its service. So it was initially hard to uh, define what is a hosting provider if you want to count an incident for that entity on the network. So here we use the, uh, each ASN as a hosting provider, uh, which is not 100% precise, but in later studies we improved that to use who is data to um, more precisely recognize that entity. So uh, f the first step is that we count unique abuse per AS. Uh, and then you have to normalize that abuse uh, based on the size that uh, size estimates I already explained. It can be second level domain. It can be I number of IPs per AS. It can be a uh, number of advertised IP space advertised in uh, BGP data. So using uh, DNSDB passive DNS data, we could actually count the number of IPs that we see, which is totally different from the number of IPs that is advertised per AS. So you see some ASs are not using uh, a big amount of their IP spaces. So then if you use that uh, indicator for estimating the size, it's not really valid or it's not fair. Uh, and then uh, from the abuse map and the size map, you normalize the abuse per size of the provider. We did it for all of the size estimates to see how different it would be. And then from the normalized abuse, you rank the providers in the network. Uh, we used um, what we call um, a 
voting method uh, to rank the provider. So we looked um, at all of our incident data and we uh, put a um, score for each of the providers and then uh, we saw that how many times a provider is in top 50 of each of the, the data incident feeds. And then we come up with the abuse ranking or reputation metric and then later we publish this uh, to, to the Dutch National Police for Dutch hosting providers. And, and uh, so we saw that in practice, it's also something used to notify provider X if you are doing bad and what is that, etc. So if you, are, if you are looking at the results of the, the metrics, um, the first thing you see is that size of a provider, so if a housing provider is bigger, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are more infected. Um, and indeed, the worst performer, which has rank one, so the rank is from zero to one, the, has rank one is indeed not the biggest, neither in terms of uh, number of second TLDs it's hosting, nor in terms of advertised IV space. The color bar uh, shows the size of advertised IP space per provider. Uh, of course, each circle in the graph is a provider. So if we compare both of our metrics, so the uptime metric or the time that it takes a provider to, to take down an abuse domain, uh, we compare this, which, which you can see in the, on the x-axis, with the number of times that um, phishing or abused uh, domains are reported, so occurrence of the abuse per provider. Here again, you see if a provider has more uh, abuse reported, it doesn't mean necessarily that they are uh, doing bad in terms of taking down domains, so there is no uh, significant relation between taking down quickly or having better abuse handling to having more uh, abuse reported. Indeed, if you look at the worst performer, uh, which you can still see it in the graph, uh, the one that has score one, you see that it's not the worst in terms of uptime score. So um, there are a bunch of really small uh, hosting providers that are probably doesn't have the facilities or uh, does not have the enough um, investment to invest on abuse handling, which we would guess. We would get, guess that a lot of these resellers wouldn't have good abuse handling in place. And when we are talking with hosting providers, the feedback that we are getting is that most of the, the, the abuse is coming from the resellers, but not the, the main entity. What is important uh, to take into account when these kind of shaming lists or scores are reported is that uh, you also, one also has to note that the responsible entity, so, and which, it, which depends on the type of service you're getting. Uh, some services indeed uh, put the responsibility of abuse handling on the customers, like if you have dedicated servers or if you have uh, unmanaged servers, etc. Uh, to wrap up the presentation, what are the practical implications of what I just explained? Uh, as I explained in the beginning of the presentation, the main reason this whole research is being done is to reduce the information asymmetry that is present in this market. So you can help users to be able to uh, evaluate the, the services that they are getting, also to ha help the providers themselves to be able to evaluate themselves uh, with their uh, competitors in the market. And then this is a mechanism to in improve the incentives of these providers to perform better. And um, to give you an example, last year we did the same study for ISPs, or last year, two years ago, uh, and we presented our results in a, in a meeting, in a OECD uh, meeting. And then, uh, indeed, that was resulted in, a, um, in creating 
uh, anti-botnet centers in the Netherlands and some other countries in Europe. Let alone that later on, we also investigated the effect of these anti-botnet centers. Uh, what I, what the point I was trying to uh, make is that indeed making uh, uh, the metrics can affect uh, the actual market players to improve better. And then uh, they can also see how effective their policies are. Uh, if they are initiating some kind of anti-badnet uh, centers or other similar uh, initiatives. And then, uh, and that helps to have evidence-based uh, uh, policies if you want to regulate uh, this market or for Dutch uh, police of uh, other entities that are collaborating with us. That was it. Um, and if you have any questions, yeah? Uh, is there any metric uh, that you would like to have that can also currently determine because there's no data to establish a metric? Yes, they are. So indeed, what I've just presented is, um, is a result of us begging for data. It's, so it's always very hard to, to get the data that we want. Uh, and even if we have few data sources, uh, it's not always uh, legitimate to use those because they can create all kinds of biases. So in order to make a comprehensive metric that can actually be an indicator uh, for an entity like police, we have to have a different data sources, different varieties, different geolocations, so we can claim that we actually, so this metric is actually explain what's happening. We have the same issue with registrars, because we are also, so a part of the project is to come up metrics for the registrars, but uh, it's really hard to get access to the size estimates of the registrars. The data is not publicly available, and those who have it are not willing to give it for free. And we are a research institute, so we cannot pay, and etc. Yeah? Uh, no. Well, uh, let me correct my answer. It's not publicly published, uh, but uh, for instance, the result for .nl uh, TLD is being discussed with the operator themselves in a private meeting. Uh, there is a, uh, so we published like 10 days ago a, a, re a paper that uh, for housing providers, what I just explained, but we didn't name anybody yet. Um, and because it because we may have to go through some legal issues that we uh, prefer to have them in advance. Um, but I've but I've done uh, research in first year of my PhD on banks and uh, the fact that why some banks are targeted more than the others. I use Zeus data and I published the names. So, uh, but I just went through that process of. Uh, uh, of um, making sure that nothing will happen if we publish and it doesn't have any legal issues, etc. Yes? Uh, can you say that only at the graph area, there was not much difference, or there was no difference between taking a refractive domain offline quickly or taking a refractive domain offline very slowly? But what does that not mean that there's not much incentive for the hosting provider of that domain? Um, if you were, because I, I'm not sure if uh, I said so, yeah, so what I said uh, was that there is no relation between if a hosting provider is taking down its domain quickly or quicker uh, and the fact that a hosting provider has more reported domains. So what I claimed is that you might be a hosting provider that has a very good abuse handling a unit, but yet you have a lot of abuse reported domains. So, but of, but but of course, if you are um, good in terms of abuse handling, which then means less uptime score, you are more incentivized to to also clean uh, your reported domains. But that is what you refer to is indeed the base problem that we are tackling here. 
So we are trying to incentivize these players to, to wake up, basically, as they call it themselves, and to act upon uh, what is being reported to them. Yeah, it, uh, it varies a lot, but I can say most of them are very open. So, like I said, indeed, um, when you talk to them, they don't—they are—they are not aware of what's going on themselves. Also, so we, as a neutral party, are actually so they are willing to collaborate, or most of them, to collaborate with us because we are neutral. We have no benefit on reporting anybody uh, over the other network players. So then. Uh, and then, and then, if you actually can get to the point that you have a meeting with them, then they are more open to share their data if there is no uh, ethical issues with that. And then, and then that is how we could up to the, uh, get to to this point to have a comprehensive data to be able. So that's with collaboration with the providers themselves. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's 100% uh, true, uh, and that is the ultimate goal of publishing. Uh, but um, so there are steps uh, that we are designing to go through to improve the incentive structure, and indeed the first step is to have a closed meeting with the market players uh, in it first and see how that would affect their performance. And then the second step is to publish the list uh, worldwide. But uh, at, at the moment, the current focus of the work is on dot, on .nl, TLD, or Dutch hosting providers. And, um, and to have it uh, enclosed only with them. And then uh, later also on internet, so then users can see it and can be able to evaluate. But there is, uh, I mean, there is an, always an important um, issue in all the ranks uh, that ranks themselves can also be played. This is what is always very important, and we should be careful with publishing them online because uh, we want to make sure that whatever we are coming up for an international community is 100% accurate. So then the first check is to check it with the providers themselves. And the checks are indeed all the variables that we use to normalize, like the size of the provider or uh, the, the whatever data that we see in passive DNS databases. Is that true? Is that you really the IP size that you're using? Is that really so then we can improve our uh, studies and research? Yes? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was that is, uh, so if I go back to the slide, the question was that is it fair if we come up with such a visual presentation for comparing uh, badness in a country like the Netherlands, which, is, which may not be comparable in terms of other variables like the speed of internet or even accessibility of internet or the number of internet users. Indeed, that's true. Uh, so, um, we are not doing these kind of things, uh, and this is indeed the reason why we are using size estimate, uh, estimators. So this is how you normalize an effect of something controlled for another variable. So, but what is important, and we see the trend, 
is that there are a lot of malicious activities started, initiated from other countries, but the servers are located in the Netherlands. It can be due to legal uh, properties of Dutch hosting providers. Uh, there is more research is going on to that. And it's indeed because a lot of hosting providers are giving free services. So then it attracts international community. It doesn't mean that Netherlands itself is performing bad, but it, it can be that it's a heaven for a lot of malicious activity from all over the world. Yeah. Exactly. So the question was that, uh, what is passive DNS data? It's uh, the data gathered by sensors uh, sniffing uh, passive traffic. So basically, we have an overview of what domains are queried. Yes. Uh, sorry? Uh, well, it's the tools that we are developing. No, no, no specific software. It's just uh, the tools that we are developing the ourselves. So for the uptime metric, we develop uh, DNS-based scanner uh, or a, a colleague of mine in the group. And for the other ones, uh, it's just us working and coding. Uh, it's no, yeah. Some of the, the data that we are getting has their own APIs that we use, but uh, apart from that, no software. Yes? Uh, it takes into account the location of the router of the router of the router of the router of uh, yes, so we did, I didn't present it in this study, but uh, and that mainly is because it's not, uh, how should I say it? So when you, if, if you want to focus on a geolocation, there are a lot of other factors that influences that. It can be that one country has a policy that uh, attracts a lot of, so that's why it's not included in this study and this graph is by, not by us, but by a third party report. So uh, we have done studies on that, uh, and it's more complicated. So if you geolocate an IP, uh, it, that IP can also be uh, controlled from another location outside of that country. So you cannot attribute um, linearly. Um, and indeed, what you say is true. There are other factors that influence it. Any other questions? In that case, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.